All right, so at the beginning of the week, I mentioned that, uh, can everybody hear me or is it too loud? Okay, good. Um, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm a, I'm a clinician scientist um, who's dedicated in my professional life to improving an awareness of the endothelium and by extension, the vasculature as an integrated organ system, you know, teeming with life, every bit as active as any other organ system in the body. And as somebody who advocates interdisciplinary approaches to understanding human health and disease, I've incorporated evolutionary um, biology into my thinking, both in research as well as teaching. So I'd like you to consider today as kind of a case study of how one might incorporate evolutionary biology into a larger explanatory framework in understanding and teaching about human health and disease. Now, I typically lecture to clinician scientists, to basic scientists, uh, occasionally to historians, and very rarely to evolutionary biologists. And I tend to target my talk and flesh out or, or delve into uh, certain details depending upon the audience. And I'm going to point that out as I go along. But it's always with the same framework. And that includes some combination of modern day molecular biology, cell biology, the historical foundation upon which endothelial biomedicine is based, and then evolutionary considerations. You all know why evolution is important today. Why is the history of medicine important? It's important because it teaches us how science progresses. And more importantly, it reminds us that we don't work in a vacuum. Right? We all are enamored by our own research program, but science didn't start with us. It didn't start with the molecular revolution, or cell theory, or even natural selection. In fact, it began in the days of the ancient Greeks, when people like Hippocrates and Aristotle began to ask questions about non-divine natural causes. Galen, who I will mention in a few moments, adopted and built on the system of the ancients. William Harvey took Galen's system and completely turned it upside down, and we continue to build incrementally, and only incrementally, on Harvey's system. All right, so to state the obvious, and likely as a result of time distance constraints of diffusion, we have evolved all, or at least most, multicellular organisms, a cardiovascular system. In vertebrates, the cardiovascular system is closed. That is, blood is always maintained within the confines of blood vessels. Blood is oxygenated in the lungs. It is then distributed to the arteries, uh, to the various tissues of the body by way of the arteries. Blood releases or exchanges gases as well as nutrients at the level of the capillaries and is then returned to the lung for reoxygenation. And in effect, blood goes around and around the body in a circular motion. Now this entire system, which spans over 100,000 miles within a human body, is lined by a cell lining called the endothelium. The endothelium is a spatially distributed organ system. It pervades every organ in the body, from the tip of the nose to the tip of the big toe. In fact, blood vessels are no further than a few microns away from every tissue cell in the body. So an average human being, the endothelium weighs about a kilogram, and it spans over 4,000 square meters of surface area. We now know that the endothelium, despite what it was believed to be several years ago, that is an inert layer of nucleated cellophane that simply served as a barrier between flowing blood and underlying tissue, that it really is involved in many physiological processes. It's a perm-selective membrane. It mediates trafficking of white blood cells from the blood to underlying tissue. It mediates hemostasis, that is the ability to maintain blood in the fluid state and in times of trauma or breakage or rupture of the blood vessels to clot and prevent excessive blood loss. It is absolutely critical in controlling vasomotor tone and that means the constriction or the dilatation of blood vessels is involved in innate and acquired Im immunity and of course new blood vessel formation. The endothelium is not a single cell type. It displays remarkable heterogeneity in space and time, in structure and function, in health and disease. And this gives rise to the term that we use in the field of vascular biology, namely endothelial heterogeneity. So for example, endothelial cells that line the straight segments of arteries, but not veins, are oriented along the longitudinal axis of blood flow. From a functional standpoint, the endothelium displays a remarkable division of labor. So for example, endothelium that lines the arterioles of the cardiovascular system are primarily 
involved in controlling vasomotor tone through the regulated release of a number of vasodilators and vasoconstrictors. By contrast, endothelial cells that line post-capillary venules, which is the site of immunity of inflammation, mediate both plasma leakage as well as the trafficking of leukocytes, that is white blood cells, between blood and underlying tissue through the inducible regulated expression of a number of adhesion molecules. Now the arteries and veins are the conduits of the cardiovascular system. They're the highways, so to speak, that deliver blood and return blood back to the heart through the arteries and veins respectively. Consistent with their role as transport vessels, their walls are thick, and that's particularly true in the case of arteries, made up of smooth muscle cells and elastin, and in this way they allow the artery to withstand the high pressures in systole and to provide elastic recoil during diastole. Now if the artery and the veins are the conduits of the system, the capillaries are the business end. This is the marketplace. This is where all the exchange of nutrients and gases takes place between blood and underlying tissue. Consistent with Fick's law of diffusion, capillaries comprise the vast majority of the surface area of the circulation. Moreover, they're extraordinarily thin. They're essentially three-dimensional tubes of endothelium without any cell lining, except the occasional presence of smooth muscle cell-like cells called pericytes. They're like a speaker wire that have been stripped of its insulation. Now the endothelium that lines arteries and veins is always continuous. They're, the endothelial cells are, uh, are together by virtue of zipper-like tight junctions, whereas the endothelium that line capillaries, they may be continuous, as shown on the left at the bottom. They may be permeated by tiny little holes, the so-called fenestrations, or they may have large gaps within them and a very poorly formed discontinuous underlying basal lamina or basement membrane depending upon the needs of the tissue. So for example, fenestrated endothelium is characteristic of organs that are involved in a high degree of filtration and secretion. One example being the kidney glomerulus, another example being uh, the endocrine glands. Now when we talk about vascular, vascular biology, vascular medicine, vascular surgery, vascular research, if I line up 10 people on the street or I line up 10 physicians and ask them what we mean, nine out of 10 will talk about the large arteries and large veins of the body. That is the sites of atherosclerosis and deep venous vein thrombosis respectively. This is the domain of the cardiologist, the neurologist, and the peripheral vascular surgeon. And for good reason, because acute myocardial infarction and stroke cause the vast majority of mortality in the Western world. But it is noteworthy that we are focusing on just a few inches of the vascular tree, just a quantum dot relative to the vast expanses of microvessels that permeate the body. And this is really the most important message for my vascular biology, particularly my physician or clinician audience, and that is that an understanding of the structure and function of the microvessels, that is the capillaries, holds important clues as to the pathophysiology of disease and by extension diagnosis and treatment. And one might put at the bottom where I have, et cetera, a really beautiful picture that Peter Ellison showed the other day of the placenta. I could put up 30 different vascular beds here. An understanding of the structure function of the capillaries holds important clues to underlying pathophysiology. And it is completely ignored in clinical medicine. Now our preoccupation with large vessels actually has its roots in history. So the ancients, such as Galen, felt that the arteries and veins were completely uncoupled, completely different systems, and in retrospect, it's understandable why. They couldn't see the invisible capillaries. Rather, what they saw was a series of vessels that carried red-colored uh, blood that were extremely thick-walled and always lay within deep tissues. That's why when we sort of examine our body, we can't find arteries or, pul or, or palpate arteries except in very few places like the wrist. By contrast, he saw thin-walled vessels that carried blue-colored blood that lay in both superficial and deep tissue planes and didn't pulsate, and that's the veins, which we can readily see all over the surface of our body. So according to Galen, blood was formed and was made in the liver and then was distributed through, by food that was brought up through the portal vein and then was distributed by veins to the various tissues of the body, where it literally replaced the tissues that were lost by emanation. Some, and only some, of the venous blood 
went into the right ventricle and then was put into the lung through the pulmonary artery where it fed the lung. It didn't move around to the left ventricle. Blood then permeated through the right ventricle into the left ventricle. Air was brought in through the pulmonary vein into the left ventricle where it mixed with the blood that had permeated these imaginary invisible pores, which we now know don't exist. And the blood-air mixture was sent around the body through the arteries. Now these were open-ended systems where air and blood simply diffused. It just percolated at the distal end of blood vessels according to the needs, again, of the underlying tissue. Blood was not seen to circulate, but rather to ebb and flow much like the tide. Now, following Galen's death, the science and biology moved into the monasteries, where both disciplines kind of languished under the ruling thumb of theology for 1,500 years. Galen's work really fit nicely with both Christian and Islamic doctrine. In fact, his greatest book on the use of body parts, which is a phenomenal read, and I recommend it to everybody, it's absolutely stunning, um, was really one long argument from design. Galen's word became scripture. To study medicine was to study Galen. The goal over 1,500 years was not to investigate, but rather to observe, at best, but mostly to collate, to synthesize, to interpret, and to teach Galen and the ancient Greeks. So closely guarded was this uh, by the church that any dissension was punishable actually either by imprisonment or death. And this was an unfortunate fate that was met by Servetus, who was burned at the stake for daring to defy Galen and propose that blood might get from the right ventricle to the left ventricle through the pulmonary circulation. So all of this would change in 1628 when William Harvey published what amounts to the most important masterpiece in the history of biomedicine, a 72-page book, just a little pamphlet that changed the worldview of medicine. What Harvey showed using a series of very elegant physiological experiments that represented more of a methodological advance rather than a techni technological advance, he had the same tools as Galen. So, for example, a series of very elegant ligature experiments to look at direction of blood flow, crude quantitation of cardiac output, Harvey showed that blood, that arteries and veins are functionally, if not structurally, connected, and that blood goes around and around the body in a circle. In other words, blood is not consumed in the tissues, as Galen proposed, but rather is preserved. Blood does not derive from food and the liver, but rather from blood itself. This theory of the circulation would not be accepted until the last few years of Harvey's life. But once it was accepted, as I said, changed the worldview and intellectual system regarding human uh, biology. So a really interesting question here is, why was Harvey right and Galen wrong? And there are some clinical audiences in history of medicine conferences where I would take this talk down this particular route. It's a really interesting question. And a lot of different answers to it, both Galen, and, and, and the question is based on the premise that these were two individuals that were brilliant thinkers. They were passionate in their search for the truth. They had the same technological toolkit. They had dissecting instruments, they had access to dead animals, and in the case of Harvey, human, uh, human corpses. Uh, and they had ligatures. Both of them used ligatures for different reasons. So why did Harvey get it right and Galen wrong? They both got the best education of their day. They were both clinician scientists juggling, much like we do today, their research program, looking after patients, and teaching. So there are a few considerations which I flesh out when we talk about the history of medicine. One of them is that each inherited a completely different intellectual foundation. A second one is that Harvey was the first in 1,500 years to have the courage and the nerve to stand up and say, Galen was wrong. They, both inherited a different intellectual environment, Harvey, the Industrial Revolution, and Scientific Revolution. And finally, they used metaphors that were informed by the technologies of their days. So Galen had force pumps, uh, uh, Galen had bellows, Harvey had force pumps, Galen had irrigation systems uh, and aqueducts. Harvey had this whole concept of, of circular motion that was pervading society back then in both the macrocosm and the microcosm.
Now, Harvey couldn't see the capillaries. Capillaries can only be seen with a light microscope. He acknowledged that they might exist, but contrary to what most people believe, Harvey actually preferred the notion that blood simply pours into spaces, always driven through tubules. And the reason he thought this was if it remained in capillaries, as we now know it does today, how does food get out into the tissue? That was the most important question of his day. So the discovery of the capillaries would actually wait for another technological advance, namely Mal uh, Marcello Malpighi's introduction of the light microscope, just about four years after Harvey's death, reported the presence for the first time of these tiny little vessels called capillaries. Now, for 200 years, and this is, a, a, again, a fascinating debate, people asked, well, are these capillaries lined by cells? Or, or not cells, because we didn't know about cells back then, but do they have walls, or are they simply wallless channels that are drilled into tissue? And this answer would not come until 1860, many, 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 many years, 200 years later, when von Recklinghausen, for the first time, used a super, super, easy, simple technological advance, and that was the presence of a stain, the use of a stain called silver nitrate that converted an otherwise bland-looking tissue, the endothelium, into a tissue that had a cobblestone pattern. And this at the lower left is the paper. It's not an abstract. This is the paper that von Recklinghausen published. Can you imagine how, e you know, if we could only publish eight lines, no figure at all, this was it. This was in German, and if you actually translate it, it doesn't talk about the endothelium. It, it talks about mesothelium, but people attribute the discovery of the endothelium to von Recklinghausen. All right, so physiological studies in the late 1800s provided evidence for a link between inflammation and permeability as well as leukocyte transmigration. And this was the heyday of the capillary. And for good reason, that is in the pre-antibiotic era, infectious diseases, both in the acute and chronic form, reaped more havoc on the population than any other disease state. The capillaries and microvessels around the capillaries is the site where inflammation is mediated, where the host response to infection occurs. In fact, atherosclerosis would not be recognized as a disease state, let alone a public health concern, until well into the 1900s. Now focus was on the large arteries, and there was no turning back. And in fact, if you look at modern day textbooks or drug company inserts, this is the depiction of the cardiovascular system an open network of arteries. Not only does this underestimate the vast expanses of microvessels that are so important to each and every human disease state, but it dangerously approaches a galanic view of the circulation. Now, the next major technological advance was the introduction of the electron microscope with which we could look for the first time. It must have been incredibly exciting in the 1950s to look at organelles and to convert an otherwise bland bag of cytoplasm that contained a nucleus into a very complex three-dimensional structure with incredibly interesting organelles that had different functions. This changed the view of cell biology literally overnight. And if you plot the number of publications related to endothelial cells and endothelium, or look at the top line, endothelial cells and endothelium. According to the year, beginning when PubMed started in 1949, out to the time that we published this paper, 2003, what you'll see is a scattering of publications related to electron microscopy. And there's only so much you can show using electron microscopy. You're looking at dead tissue, you're looking at a static system. There's not much difference between an endothelial cell or any other cell type. There's really only one or two differences that appeared over the years. But then something happened in 1974 that led to an exponential increase in the number of papers, which now numbers over 100,000. Does anybody know what this is? What happened? Something happened. There was a technological advance. This was the introduction of cell culture. So this was introduced in 1974. For the first time, investigators, and this was originally uh, in human umbilical veins, which are easy to get, right, because every placenta at delivery, you can get those veins, you can flush out endothelial cells. So the, for the first time, investigators had the capacity to study endothelial cell biology under highly controlled conditions. 
reproducible, high, popu uh, high uh, percentage homogeneous populations of cells. But it can be argued that this price has come at a success, that we're seeing the law of diminishing returns. And the reason is that we are now approaching the endothelium as a series of isolated cells rather than the transcendent emergent organ that it is whose properties the whole is far greater than the sum of the parts. So this brings me to my next comment, and this is using, I think, the word very differently than you've heard before, but the endothelium is highly adaptive. It's plastic. It's like a chameleon. It marches to the tune of the local microenvironment. In fact, so coupled is it to the microenvironment that when you remove the cells from the tissue, they're like a fish out of water. When you culture them, they undergo phenotypic drift. They become a shadow of their former selves. And so any, any uh, results that are obtained using in vitro cell cultures must be interpreted with extreme caution. So I like to think about each and every endothelial cell as a miniature adaptive input-output device. It takes input from the environment. And this can be in the, way of, in the form of biochemical or biophysical forces. It could be shear stress. It could be strain. It could be growth factors, oxygen, uh, potassium, so on and so on and so on. The output is the phenotype of the endothelial cell. This depends on the level of, inve of investigation or the scale of investigation. Single cells may undergo a change in shape or calcium flux. They may migrate, proliferate, and undergo apoptosis. They may express certain genes or proteins. Barrier function, that is permeability, and leukocyte trafficking can be assayed at the level of tissue culture. Other properties can only be studied in the context of intact blood vessels, organs, or organisms. So examples of these emergent properties would be endothelial contribution to vasomotor tone. You can't study blood vessel dilatation and constriction in a plate of monolayer endothelial cells. Another example might be the contribution of endothelial cells to fibrin formation, which is part of hemostasis. You can't assay that in a flat plate of culture cells. Now, the input is coupled to output by a complex array of nonlinear signaling pathways that typically begin at the cell surface by way of ligand receptor interaction and end at the level of transcription or post-transcriptional control. This is where most endothelial biologists, and I include myself in this group, spend our careers with our heads stuck in the sand, using extremely reductionist approaches to understand basic mechanisms of endothelial biology. And if I'm talking to a basic science or an endothelial biology uh, audience, I will delve into my work that is involved in understanding transcriptional regulation at the level of the endothelium. Now, if we take a step back, what we will appreciate, and take the 30,000-foot view, what we will appreciate is that because endothelial cells are distributed throughout the body, they see many different microenvironments. So I'm showing two examples here. One is the blood, what we call the blood-brain barrier, which are the capillaries in the substance of the brain. These have tight junctions that are absolutely critical for maintaining the balance within the brain. They kind of remind me, after hearing P Peter Ellison's talk with the placenta, it, it, the blood-brain barrier prevents any physiological changes within the brain that come from the blood. So it's a very protective system. And the blood-brain barrier is critically dependent upon kind of a marinade of paracrine factors that are derived from surrounding astroglial cells. Whereas, let's say an endothelium in the capillary of the heart is exposed to a completely different mix of paracrine factors, in this case from surrounding muscle cells or cardiomyocytes, and by forces that are inherent in the cardiac cycle. So because input varies from head to toe, and insofar as the endothelial cell itself is a signal transducer unit, then output has to change. And in fact, if we could somehow map the phenotype of an endothelial cell, magically uh, track its transcriptome, its proteome, its behavior, its shape, everything about it at any particular point in time, what we would find is a rich color palette at one snapshot in time. And if then one were to roll the film and observe this in real time, then one might observe, insofar as the microenvironment changes from one moment to the next, that these phenotypes blink on and off or fade in and out like lights on a Christmas tree. Now, one of the challenges is proving this hypothesis. You know, you could stick a microscope into the chest of an animal and look at the heart, but that's virtually impossible to do. 
the number of windows with which we can look at the vasculature is very limited. Another problem is we'd somehow have to label a gene and follow expression of that gene. And the challenge there is we have no marker that has a short enough half-life that would allow us to track gene expression at the level of transcription. So one approach that we've taken in the lab, and this is the only primary data that I'm going to show with regards to endothelial biology, sort of proximate mechanisms, is a fate mapping study. So what we do here is we compare two different lines of mice. Well, actually three. We compare one line of mice in which we track von Willebrand factor expression at any point in time, and we use a binary system in which we track expression of that gene integrally over time, over the life of the animal. So let me just go through this briefly. The first line of mice that we make, we use homologous recombination. We choose an endothelial specific gene, and it's called von Willebrand factor. And we plop in a reporter gene called LAC-Z, right where the von Willebrand factor transcript starts. So this is, in effect, a knockout, knock-in of von Willebrand factor. And what we see when we do this, when we transfect ES cells, embryonic stem cells, we then inject blastocysts, we allow the mums to give birth, and then we generate stable lines of mice, is if you look at the blue color, which is represented a black Z, this is a whole mount of the heart from one such animal, you see expression of black Z or blue color within the veins of the heart. It's a wonderful reporter marker, the blue staining of black Z. And if you look at the expression of the endogenous von Willebrand factor gene, remember, we're using homologous recombination to go directly into the locus. It perfectly mirrors expression of the von Willebrand factor gene. So we have a really nice marker now for von Willebrand factor expression. Now, the second line, or second binary system in this case, with which we compare that first result, uses a Cree recombinase system. So what we do in this case is rather than inserting LAC-Z into the von Willebrand factor locus, we insert an enzyme called Cree recombinase. So we drive Cree recombinase off of von Willebrand factor. That Cree recombinase recognizes tracts of DNA, and it acts like a, scissor, a, scissor, a pair of scissors. It cuts at those sites. And so what we can do is we can breed now our von Willebrand factor Cree mouse with a reporter mouse in which Cree recombinase loops out a fragment of DNA or a stop codon that then allows LAXE to be expressed. And this second mouse has this transgene in every cell of the body. The only cells in which this event is going to occur are cells in which von Willebrand factor is expressed. But the beauty of the system is, once LAC-Z is expressed, it's locked in. And it's mitotically stable over generations. So you now turn a negative non-LAC-Z expressing cell into a LAC-Z expressing cell. And what you essentially get is a fate map where you measure the integral expression of LAXE over the lifetime of the animal. And if you then do that and compare our animals, what you find is that over the lifetime of the animal, using the Crelox fate mapping strategy, is you pick up every blood vessel in the heart. And this is true for most of the other organs. So what you see is you're filling in the heart between the veins, which is all capillaries, with LAC-Z expression. And what that tells us is that the capillaries are expressing von Willebrand factor in ways that blink on and off over the time or lifetime of the animal. Now, when we talk about mechanisms of endothelial heterogeneity, proximate mechanisms, I think, is nicely thought about in the framework of a, of a time-honored debate in the behavioral biosciences of nature versus nurture. So think of the following thought experiment. You take two endothelial cells that are phenotypically distinct. They could be from the brain and the heart, but let's consider for purposes of illustration two neighboring endothelial cells, phenotypically distinct. You remove those cells from the blood vessel and you culture them under identical conditions and you let them divide. If these differences in phenotype are mediated by the microenvironment, then their phenotype will drift and ultimately reach identity. If, on the other hand, the differences in phenotype are somehow locked in and epigenetically stable, then the differences will forever be retained in culture. There are a lot of experiments that indirectly address the answer, and the answer is not a surprise to anybody, and that is it is somewhere in between. That is, some phenoty phenotypes are imminently reversible when you remove them from the 
from the uh, tissue, and others are epigenetically or mitotically fixed. And the distance between these colors is inversely related to the plasticity of the endothelium. And a really interesting hypothesis in the field that is supported by some data is that with disease and aging, these two lines start to separate. In other words, your endothelium becomes less plastic, epigenetic lock-in, whether it's due to methylation or histone modification, becomes prevalent. This, the endothelium, the reaction norms, become limited. All right, so now I'm going to talk with the next few slides about evolutionary considerations and pretend that I'm talking to an audience that has no background in evolutionary biology. And I would invite, you know, Randy to, to correct me, you know, with terms I'm using improperly uh, or approaches that I'm using improperly. I've collaborated extensively with, with David Haig at Harvard University on, on some of this, but it's really at this point of the presentation quite ABC-ish. All right, so in it, I, what I would say to an audience is that in addition to proximate explanations, every biological trait requires an evolutionary explanation. We consider the endothelium as an entity or endothelial heterogeneity itself as a biological trait. So proximate mechanisms apply very traditional tools of biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology to describe the ontogeny, that is the developmental history, the anatomy and the physiology of present day organisms. Evolutionary approaches use a different tool set. They use the fossils and comparative DNA sequences and morphology to map the phylogeny or the evolutionary history of that trait and the advantage, fitness advantage that that trait provides at the level of the population or the species. And I would then go on to show a slide with Randy Nessie's book and say that the application of evolutionary principles to an understanding of human health and disease comprises a new and exciting field of evolutionary medicine. And then I would say that evolutionary biology teaches us as physicians that natural selection does not favor health, happiness, or longevity, but rather reproductive success, and that natural selection can only modify variation that exists in the population, which is constrained by the history, development, and physiology, and of course the laws of physics and chemistry. Not all differences in DNA frequency are the result of natural, uh, 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 provide a, re a reproductive fitness advantage, but can arise from drift. No trait is perfect, and Randy alluded to this yesterday. Every trait can be made better, but by making it better, you will make another trait worse, and that brings up the central tenet of the field, and that is that the human body is a jerry-rigged bundle of trade-offs, and understanding the risk-benefits of these trade-offs provides insight into the vulnerability of the human to disease states. So I will then typically go on and show an example that resonates with my audience of vascular biologists or clinicians and that is atherosclerosis. So Mr. Smith comes to the emergency room with acute chest pain and acute myocardial infarction. The physician in the emergency room is interested in proximate mechanisms. What brought Mr. Smith to the emergency room? What are the proximate explanations? Was he a smoker? Does he have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, all the classic risk factors for atherosclerosis? Or, now looking at the genetics, is there a family history of coronary artery disease? The evolutionary explanation asks a completely different question. And Peter, you can correct me if I'm wrong. The evolutionary question here is why Homo sapiens, out of all species on this planet, except for a few interesting animal models, develop atherosclerosis? And why are we, as Randy said, it's, you know, the question isn't why, why do we select for this disease, but why, do we, why do, does natural selection allow for the vulnerability of the disease? And I would, at this point, say there are many considerations, and after listening to yesterday's talk, it could have been one of the puzzles that one group discussed and come, came up with more than what I'm going to show. One of them is that natural, that natural selection is working at the level of reproductive success, and that atherosclerosis is a disease of the aged, and is therefore not selected against. A second consideration relates to the architectural constraints of the system. So the closed loop branching geometry of the cardiovascular system, by definition, engenders regions of disturbed flow. These regions of disturbed flow have been demonstrated in beautiful studies to contain endothelial cells that are sitting on the edge of inflammation. As one example, at branch points and curvatures, endothelial cells contain more NF-kappa B 
sitting in the cytoplasm than endothelial cells in the straight segments of the vasculature. NF-kappa B is an extraordinarily strong pro-inflammatory transcription factor, but it's sitting in the cytoplasm. It's not working yet. If you then give the animal, in this case mice, an infection, a dose of endotoxin, for example, what that does is it pushes the NF-kappa B at these sites into the nucleus and promotes inflammatory reaction. So in my view, this is a classic example of an evolutionary trade-off. I may be wrong, but one in which the advantages of closing your circulation and by definition engendering regions of disturbed flow outweigh the disadvantages of engendering these, these micro-domains of, of abnormal flow. And that brings up the third point, and that is that the trade-off manifests as a net liability only in the modern-day environment with its attendant increase in glucose and smoke toxins, other factors of the diet, exercise, and infectious agents. Now I'm going to come to endothelial cell heterogeneity as a biological trait and consider the evolutionary mechanisms. There are two components, as Randy mentioned yesterday, to understanding evolutionary mechanisms of health and disease. That is, the phylogenetic history, the evolutionary history, in other words, and the advantage this trait provides at the level of reproduction. Now, the endothelium in the cardiovascular system doesn't fossilize, so we're kind of left with comparative morphology and DNA sequences, or molecular phylogeny. So this is a phylogenetic tree. It's very simplified, may be wrong, but it describes the, the evolutionary relationships between present-day organisms ranging from the most primitive or most ancient, the sponges on the top, and the vertebrates at the bottom. Many morphological studies have demonstrated that the endothelium is, is present in all vertebrates but is absent in invertebrates. So let me show you one example. At the bottom is a vertebrate. It happens to be a human. It could be a fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, or mammal. What you see at the very top is the lumen of the blood vessel and is a very thin lining of endothelium. What you see at the top is an aorta from a lobster. What it has is a very thick wall, lots of smooth muscle cells, some elastin, but absolutely no cell lining facing the lumen and the circulating blood. In a human or a mammal, this would be the kiss of death. Blood has to perfuse a blood vessel that has an endothelial lining or else it will clot and stop flowing. So just these simple data suggest that the endothelium evolved following the divergence of the cephalochordate and uricordate in the ancestral vertebrate some 540 to 500 million years ago. And these are dates that David Haig gave me. I don't know whether they've changed today. Over a 40 million year period of time, the same period of time in which organisms close their cardiovascular system, developed an entire clotting system of dozens of factors, a complement system that functions at a high level, and acquired immunity, all within 40 million years. It's remarkable. Now, the most ancient of the vertebrates are the hagfish, or the jawless fish, hagfish and lamprey. And my understanding in the field is that whether hagfish or lamprey are more primitive relative to the other is a, is, is a topic of debate. But most people believe that hagfish is the most ancient vertebrate. So what that means is that any features that are shared by humans or mice and hagfish presumably are likely evolved in the ancestral vertebrate. So here's a hagfish. This is taken on my summers for, uh, he, that I spent here at Mount Desert Island. This is a postdoc that David Haig and I shared who's holding an adult specimen that's been anesthetized. Hagfish are kind of eel-like, although that's a very misleading term. Worm, uh, alien-like, um, that lives in, in non-tropical waters in both southern and northern hemisphere. They're bottom dwellers, and they can live a thousand feet below the surface, and they bury themselves under the ocean floor, from which they occasionally emerge to eat on dying or dead prey. And they do so by entering the mouth or the back end of the fish or prey, and they eat the animal from inside out. So another thing that is remarkable is they make tons of slime. It's the only vertebrate that does this. So what we've done on the left-hand side is we've injected intravenously a hagfish with histamine. This is a 10-year-old boy experiment. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to increase its slime production. You'll note that it starts to make figure eights. And it's probably doing that to rid itself of the increased slime, which now has the risk of clogging its gills. And if I fast forward this film, what you'll see is that when we artificially stimulate slime, this animal begins to completely clog up. And it's going to die unless we do this kind of hagfish equivalent of CPR, where we're taking some forceps and removing the slime. But look at the amount that it's making here. There's a lot of debate as to why these animals make slime. One possibility is that it allows, a uh, it allows them to have a lubricant to get under the ocean floor or to get in the back end or front end of an animal to eat it. Another possibility, and this is, I think, more uh, recent evidence, suggests that it can actually di direct its, its slime um, flow so that it clogs the gills of predators. But we're not really sure why. As the most ancient vertebrate, the hagfish kind of blurs and bridges the transition between invertebrates and, inverte and vertebrates. So like other vertebrates, it has a segmental body plan, that is recurring myomeres. It has a neural tube and a notochord. It has paraxial blood vessels, that is an aorta and a, in this case, a, a posterior cardinal vein. And it has a digestive tract, and you'll see at the bottom here the presence of slime glands, very unique to the hagfish. There's se several features of a hagfish that don't really represent vertebrates. It doesn't have a spleen. It has no bone. It has no cartilage. Its notochord persists in adult life. And its gills are external. So it has six openings on each side of the body. I, I'm sorry, internal, rather than teleos fish or cartilaginous fish whose gills are exterior. The cardiovascular system of the hagfish is closed, and that's what we would expect of a vertebrate. Blood is always maintained within the confines of blood vessels. But there's a couple of really cool, unique features of the hagfish cardiovascular system. One is that it has an extraordinarily low blood pressure, maybe a systolic pressure of 8, 9, or 10. There's insects out there with higher pressures. The total peripheral, total peripheral resistance is extraordinarily low. It has multiple hearts, and two of these comprise real cardiomyocyte muscle. And what you'll see on the following slide is that these two hearts actually beat at different rates. They have their own pacemaker. So the bronchial heart is typical for any fish. The portal heart is unique to the hagfish. And it is believed that the portal heart, which is not present in any prevertebrate ancestor, evolved in the hagfish as an adaptive mechanism to propel blood that has come back at probably a 0.2 millimeter of mercury pressure through the systemic resistance of the liver back into the heart. The last feature that's really interesting about the hagfish cardiovascular system is that uh, unlike other vertebrates, it has this enormous complex system of sinuses that contain about 30% of the blood volume of the animal. The most prominent of these sinuses is called the subcutaneous or dorsal sinus that that really goes along the back of the animal all the way from head to tail. It contains an enormous amount of blood. And what's fascinating is that these sinuses, which are connected to the systemic circulation, that the blood is mobilized from sinus to systemic circulation when the animal becomes agitated. So in effect, it provides a preload boost to the animal to improve cardiac output at times of stress. Now, what we showed was that the endothelium that lines the sinuses as well as the systemic vessels of the hagfish contains endothelial cells. And the endothelial cells are classic in many ways for the vertebrate endothelium. For example, I didn't talk about Weibel-Pilotti bodies, but they're very specific to endothelial cells. We found them rich in vesicular structures, on and on and on. But what's important for purposes of today's discussion is that the endothelium in the hagfish is extraordinarily heterogeneous, both from the standpoint of structure and function and molecular markers. So let me show you a couple of examples. This is the skin of a hagfish. On the upper right is an intravital movie that we took on the fin. So what you're seeing is blood vessels moving very, very slowly through the capillaries. What you see in the top left is a cross-section through the body of, sorry, let me just go back, to the body of the hagfish. And what you'll appreciate here is the skin at the top, this huge dorsal sinus where it normally contains blood, 
uh, and then the rest of the body. But I'm going to focus on the skin for a moment. Here's an electron micrograph of the skin from the hagfish. If you look at the bottom left, and this is often if I'm talking to medical students, I'll say, well, what is it about this, this capillary at the bottom which makes this unusual for, you know, for what we're familiar with? And one of the answers is that the red cells are nucleated. And that's a really interesting question, right? Is that why mammals and no other vertebrates lost their nucleus? A nucleate red cells, a nucleate platelets are specific to mammals. The other thing is that the capillary contains three blood cells. This is highly unusual. Capillaries typically have blood cells that are that go through in line, you know, cell by cell by cell. So it's a larger diameter capillary than most vertebrates. But if you look at the intracell, well, if you look at the endothelium, it's classic for, let's say, a mouse or a human endothelium. If you look at the right, where I've blown up one of the junctions between two endothelial cells, this has tight junctions, it has adherence junctions, it looks just like an endothelium from a vertebrate. If you look at the heart, it's a different story. Here, the endothelium is very foamy. It's electron lucent. It has a few mitochondria you see in the middle, the dark, and next to it is a large vacuole. And then you see these little kind of bridges between the surface and the underlying uh, basal lamina. And these are cavioli, or plasma lama vesicles, that allow the transfer through transcytosis of material from one side to the other of the endothelial cell, classic for vertebrate endothelium. And you can even see diaphragms on some of these cavioli, which again is classic for uh, vertebrate endothelium. But it's a foamy appearance. It looks strange. We know this heart is in good shape because if we go down to the cardiomyocyte, it has very healthy mitochondria. So this is not an artifact of the preparation. And as a final example, here's the liver. This is bizarre. So what you see with the liver here is an hepatocyte at the bottom, the lumen of the capillary at the top, and then you see one endothelial cell called EC2. But look at endothelial cell 1. It has a huge gap you could drive a truck through. And if you look at multiple sections of the liver, this is what you see. You see very, very easy communication between the lumen of the blood vessel and the underlying hepatocyte. So what this tells us is not only did endothelium evolve in the ancestral vertebrate, but endothelial heterogeneity as a biological trait also evolved right from the beginning. In other words, it's not an extra add-on during evolution, during mammalian evolution, for example, it's not just an intellectual curiosity or plaything. It, it, it's really part of the very fabric of the endothelium. It's not just a descriptor of multiple phenotypes across the circulation. It is a core property in and of itself. Now, with regards to the second question, this is much harder, obviously. What was the fitness advantage that was provided not only by the endothelium, which is an interesting question of, in itself, but what fitness advantage was provided by the heterogeneous nature of the endothelium? Well, it's likely that endothelium became heterogeneous right from the start because it has to subserve so many needs across the body. It marches to the tune of the microenvironment. It has to target what it's doing to the needs of that tissue environment. Another consideration is that the endothelium has to cope with many different environments. So, for example, if you look at the kidney, which is my favorite example, the endothelial cells that live down in the inner medulla are exposed normally to a profound hypoxia, hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia. How do they survive? They're clearly different from the endothelium that lines capillaries of the lung that see the highest oxygen concentration in the body. We don't know what the kidney endothelium looks like because we can't culture it, we can't really assay for it, but I think it's reasonable to assume that they are phenotypically distinct from those of the lung. And this type of consideration raises other interesting questions. What about the Antarctic ice fish? How does its endothelium survive at temperatures less than zero degrees? The shark has uric acid levels in its blood that would kill us many times over. How does the endothelium in the shark deal with high uric acid? How about the individual that goes to high altitude or dives deep down or goes into space? How does its endothelium adapt to pushing the limits, the, 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 the normal uh, range of, of, of limits that the endothelium typically sees? These are really interesting questions and in some cases uh, clinically important. So one reason to study the history of medicine is not so much to learn the mistakes of our predecessors, but actually to return to new questions. 
Galen was many things. He was, he was arrogant, he was, he was obnoxious, he, he was a prolific writer who, you know, wrote circles around many people. Uh, he was a surgeon and physician to the gladiators back in the uh, days of Marcus Aurelius and, and Commodus. He was very close to Commodus, the evil son of Marcus Aurelius who was the subject of the film Gladiator. But he was a brilliant observer. And what Galen did is he would recognize the difference between arteries and veins. He recognized that arteries and veins carry different kind of blood. He talked about many different blood vessels throughout the body. The renal vessels, the pulmonary vessels, the vessels in the arms. And he said, these are different than these ones, and these are different than those. There was a dynamic complexity to Galen's system. It was alive. It was vibrant. It was vital. Harvey, by contrast, was a mechanist. His whole system, although it was correct, revolved around a force pump that forced the blood around and around the body in a circle. There was a certain periodicity and monotony to his system. He didn't talk about differences in blood vessels. With one exception, he noted veins with, uh, he noted valves within the veins of humans. He thought that differences in the color of blood was an artifact of taking blood. In other words, that when you put a needle into an artery, the reason it's red is because you have lots of pressure forcing the blood out, and that turns the blood from blue to red. He got it all wrong. He didn't recognize that there is a dynamic complexity to the system. What we know about endothelial biology today is, first of all, that yes, there's differences between artery and veins. There's lots of differences between different capillaries. Blood does, in fact, contain uh, blood vessels do in fact contain blood of different color. We now know that endothelium is, and blood vessels are critically involved in mediating vasomotor tone, vasoconstriction, and so on and so on. In that way, our model is more approaching Galen's. And in this respect, Galen in many ways got things that were right and that are ignored from historian, historical standpoint when we look back at Galen and Harvey. So I'm going to end with this slide, and I always show this slide no matter what audience I'm talking about, and that is this notion that endothelial biologists are typically in two camps. The one camp says, I don't want to know about the six trillion colors. I want to know what makes an endothelial cell. Tell me the default phenotype of an endothelium. The splitters, and I'm an avowed splitter, says, I, you know, the complexity doesn't paralyze me. It's actually absolutely fascinating. Not only is the complexity interesting, but it provides important insights into how we might develop therapies that target different sites of the vascular tree, for example, or at different times in the lifespan. It's not a paralyzing phenomenon. The, both questions are, are right in different contexts. So somebody who's interested, for example, in understanding, well, what makes an endothelial cell different from a cardiomyocyte, you know, it's not such a bad idea to say, let's put the colors aside and think about a common color. What is it that really makes this lineage move and go? But really, the splitting idea is much more important. And I would simply end by saying, don't walk away thinking that there's 60 trillion phenotypes. And this is a concept that uh, Craig will talk about. There's, there's a few phenotypes. There, there's many phenotypes, but not an infinite amount. Endothelial cells kind of follow attractor basins, and, and there's some phenotypes that are more stable than others. But the important point here is that the endothelium displays multiple phenotypes whose understanding is important for treating human, uh, humans with disease. All right, so I'd like to end there, and if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>